It's 1875. Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi is using what little money his French partners have collected to build part of the Statue of Liberty, a desperate attempt to demonstrate its potential at the United States Centennial Celebration, only five months away. This would be the perfect time to showcase what his vision for the statue is and probably get a lot more people behind it and their pocketbooks. He's decided to construct the hand holding the torch. I mean, it's the liberty enlightening the world. And so to have the torch says it all. It's also beautiful and it's also dramatic. Bartholdi will hammer copper into the shapes of the flames. He plans to gild them with gold and illuminate them with floodlights but he has an even bigger thrill in mind. He was planning to use every fundraising apparatus that he could, and the way to do that would be to sell tickets and let them go up into the torch and uh, walk around the uh, flame. Patrons will climb a 40-foot ladder, the width of a fire escape, to a balcony surrounding the flame. But to build just part of the statue to scale, Bartoldi must figure out how to construct the whole thing. This project was something unlike any previous sculpture. You couldn't just cast it out of bronze. You couldn't carve it out of a single block of marble. It had to be constructed. It was an engineering project, more like a building than a work of art. You need someone who is more or less an architect in order to make it stand up, not necessarily an artist like Bartholdi. Good afternoon, Professor. August Bartholdi. I have been reading about your statue, which is why I'm here. Eugene Violet Le Duc is a former mentor of Bartholdi, and this is a guy who knows his math. He was charged with creating much of the statuary in, the, in Notre Dame. He creates the gargoyles. It will be impossible to assemble it as one solid piece. If you'll only look at the plans. Show me. The statue is tall, about 13 stories, and thin. At the time, the only structures built that high, like some churches, have a much wider base. Bartoldi's Colossus will have to be on the cutting edge of a new construction technique. A traditional building, you build the walls, and the walls hold up the structure. The Statue of Liberty, in effect, one of the first examples of what, in architecture, they call a curtain wall. You build a strong frame first, and then you hang the exterior wall from it. The wall doesn't hold up the building. The building holds up the wall. Violet Le Duc needs to figure out materials for the inner frame and Liberty's exterior. and he chooses what he knows, a wood frame for the inside of the statue, covered with a layer of plaster, and for the exterior skin, copper. It's the most lightweight, plentiful metal available, and a striking color, at least at first. But when it rusts, and its color of rust is called patina, it has that greenish um, color, and that's just copper oxide. This chemical process takes decades to complete. So when it was first, Built. They called it the Copper Lady. You know, it, it looked like a penny. Violet Le Duc has used copper and wood in statues less than 30 feet tall. But this is five times that, requiring 4,000 square feet and 31 tons of hammered copper pushed to its absolute limit. I think this is crazy when you pause and think about it. You go out to that harbor and look at it, that copper statue is about the thickness of maybe two pennies put together. That's it. The thickness of the copper in the Statue of Liberty is as thick as it needs to be. If it's any thicker, it would add an immense amount of weight. But for the statue's engineers, the question is still, will the whole structure be strong enough? It has to face enormous strain and stress of, of weather and wind. Bartoldi also has a design issue. What will Liberty hold in her left hand? If we look at early models of the Statue of Liberty, Lady Liberty is actually clutching broken chains in her hand. It's inspired by the abolition of the formerly enslaved. But Bartoli realizes that as the nation 
is moving further and further away from the Civil War, the tone, the mood has shifted in the United States. He decides instead to pick up on the centennial, and he has inscribed in the book that Lady Liberty is holding, July 4th, 1776. Bartoldi doesn't abandon the chains idea. He places them at Liberty's feet, but it's a detail only visible from above. If it had maintained its original meaning of abolition, it would become a reminder of unfinished projects and ambitions that we still struggle with till this day. Around 10 million visitors attend the fair. American innovation takes center stage. With the debut of Alexander Graham Bell's telephone, the Remington typewriter, even Heinz ketchup. The Industrial Revolution is finally allowing them to, if you will, maximize the incredible wealth and resources of their country. They are an entire continent full of possibility. In October 1876, with just a few weeks left in the exposition, Bartoldi's team achieves a miracle. The hand and torch of Lady Liberty make their debut in Philadelphia. Liberty enlightening the world. This is just one section of a much larger. Can I climb it? Of course. 50 cents. 50 cents a piece, which is about $15 today. The crowds react to Bartoldi's creation better than he could have hoped. On October 28, 1886, the city of New York holds an official inauguration celebration for the Statue of Liberty. Lady Liberty is like no statue the world has ever known. It's the tallest structure of any kind in New York, visible from 25 miles away. Her shoe size, if she needed one, would be 879. And it was the biggest event that the city of New York had ever seen. The parade was endless, bands and carriages. Throngs of spectators board ferries to Bedloe's Island for the unveiling of Liberty Enlightening the World. The press is already referring to it as the Statue of Liberty, but many also call it the Bartoldi Statue. <laughs> It's like the work of the old Egyptians. I hope it lasts as long. Frederick Auguste Bartholdi will never again produce anything approaching the scale of the Statue of Liberty. But with it, his legacy is secure. Really what we have is one person, this one artist who had this vision, and no matter how many terrible things happened, he insisted on getting it done. I really don't think Bartholdi could have foreseen how the Statue of Liberty would affect people immigrating to the United States. The poem the new Colossus with that iconic phrase, give me your tired, your poor. That poem doesn't get affixed to the base of the pedestal until 1903. But for so many people, for generations, the first they glimpsed of America, of course, would have been arriving by sea. And that initial welcome, uh, that very first thing that sent a message about what kind of place you had risked everything to make as your home would have been this extraordinary statue. So the Statue of Liberty has become the emblem of American identity. And it's not just Americans. The idea of liberty and democracy and the light of the world has transcended our national borders. It's become something more, it's become human. It's become the idea, the perfect version of human conduct.